Sparta, of all the Greek city-states, is the one that resisted most of all in ancient times the encroachments of international money power and the circulation of precious metals and all those demoralizing factors deriving therefrom. However, from those laws promulgated by Lycurgus in Sparta in the early 6th century BC, it would seem that all those evils deriving from giving such international money power free reign had already been experienced and had brought about that reaction amongst the people generally that enabled Lycurgus to take those measures by which he expunged forever the main causes of the sickness of greed and self-interest which ate at the heart of the Doric people. To him are ascribed those laws directed towards this purpose, such as are described by Plutarch, quote, Not contented with this redistribution of land, he resolved to make a division of their movables too, that there might be no odious distinction or inequality left among them. But finding it would be very dangerous to go about it openly, he took another course and defeated their avarice by the following stratagem. He commanded that all gold and silver coin should be called in, and that only a sort of money of iron should be current, a great weight and quantity of which was very little worth, so that to lay up twenty or thirty pounds there was required a pretty large closet, and to remove it nothing less than a yoke of oxen. With the diffusion of this money, at once a number of vices were banished from Lacedaemon, for who would rob another of such coin, who would unjustly detain or take by force or accept as a bribe, a thing which was not easy to hide or a credit to have, or indeed of any use to cut in pieces, for when it was red hot they quenched it in vinegar, and by that means spoiled it, and made it almost incapable of being reworked. End quote. The so-called Spartan way of life derived from the necessity of the Spartans to always be prepared for total war from abroad, as their final rejection of international money power made certain would come, and to be always prepared for war within, i.e. insurrection, an equal certainty deriving from the same causes. The first Messenian War, in 730 BC, was entered into by King Theopompus of Sparta for the usual reasons for any war in a state indicated by archaeological findings, as being under the thumb of international money power, instigation by that money power in favor of its arms industry and its other long-range purposes. The long-drawn-out character of the war indicated that the Messenians had equal access to international arms industry with Sparta. Armies are not raised and maintained in long-drawn-out wars without finances acceptable in international trade, and ready access to the best of weapons and equipment, and it is clear that the Messenians were not short of such. This war served that purpose most desirable to money power of reducing the power of kings. The First and Second Messenian Wars were both followed by constitutional crises. The first settlement was a victory of the Spartan peers over the kings and a curbing of royal prerogatives and powers. Such would have been typical of the progress of international money power in its usual insidious takeover of any state or civilization. The crisis after the Second Messenian War was at least within the ranks of the Spartans themselves, a democratic one, if that very dubious word can be used. The long drawn out character of the Second War indicated the same underlying factor of the original War of Conquest, international money power extending its favors to both sides, to the insurgents and to Sparta. The final edicts of Lycurgus, as a result of the constitutional crisis that followed the Second Messenian War, certainly indicate he was aware of the loss of sovereignty that came to any state that based its monetary system on the product of the international silver bullion brokers, and which meant dependence on their good graces, the more especially if such state had no minds of its own. The Second Messenian War was intended to establish a total democracy, that is, total rule of the international banking fraternity and it failed in so far as such purpose was concerned. Lycurgus's answer to a man in the crowd who insisted he create a democracy was to approach him and slap him in the face, saying, First create a democracy in your own home, if you dare. There is no doubt that early in the 6th century BC, the Spartans totally excluded the international money market, such as controlled the rest of Greece through silver and gold money, and the bankers' practices relating thereto. They also excluded foreign trade as being equally destructive of the order of life they wished to preserve. Sparta was fortunate to possess considerable reserves of iron ore, the principal deposits being at the Malian Cape and the Tenarian Promontory. Thus, both for her money and for her arms, she was therefore independent and needed no assistance from abroad. The laws of Lycurgus excluding international money and trade directly continued the fomentation of that warlike spirit and racial and national pride bred in the Spartans out of the trials of the long drawn out Messenian Wars, and which later brought them in as saviors at Thermopylae, and indeed of Carthage at the end of the First Punic War in 255 BC, when the army of Regulus encamped before the city was destroyed by Xantippus the Spartan. 
The very fact that the power of the kings had been undermined by the First Messenian War, although their positions as absolute leaders of the people in war still existed, became a blessing in disguise. History has shown that the point to which international money power immediately gravitates when financially penetrating any people living in natural order is the top, the king himself, either directly or through the priesthood. Given his sanction and connivance in respect to their schemes, then peoples whose very souls have leaned towards the king as to the Lord's anointed are easily subdued, and their minds filled with arithmetical calculations and obsession with their animal needs, instead of that great glory of a oneness with the deity, a oneness with the harmony of the universe. Therefore, one of the first steps of such money power towards total assumption of rule has been the eradication of kings and kingly power. Even though a king might be led into connivance with the banker's schemes through lack of understanding, he could always still awaken and discover his mistake, and realizing the sword was still in his hand, take measures to regain his prerogative. Therefore, he has to be disposed of or reduced to a paid and willing servant. In Sparta, there seems to have been another obstacle to the promoters of that phony democracy advocated by the international money power. The intervention at Athens, which led to the Peloponnesian War beginning in 431 BC, and the total opposition to the Pisistratids, was obvious policy in view of the unrelenting pressure of Athenian money power as a branch of international money power against Sparta, a city that had made mockery of the power of the counting houses of the world financial centers, and which had set up an example to the world which would become inspiration to others. The hostility to kingly power by the ephorate would be guided by what they doubtless saw was the need, if their national life was to be maintained, of making sure that kings in no way had the power to surrender themselves and the people they represented to the blandishments of international money power, whose opportunity has always been a weak and ill-instructed king. However, the remark of Archidamus, king of Sparta, at the commencement of the war reveals, even at that time, how the corruptive forces outpouring from Babylonia with its immediate agents had certainly re-entered Sparta to some degree. For he was quoted as saying, And war is not so much a matter of armaments as of the money that makes them effective. In his speech to his own people, Archidamus also warned them of the 6,000 talents of silver, some 650 tons, supposedly held by the Athenians in the Acropolis. Both of these statements show no understanding of that in which a king should above all be instructed, national monetary emission, and prove how right were the ephors and the controls with which they surrounded kingship. Archidamus privately was close friend of Pericles, one of the co-creators of the democracy in Athens, and scion of the Alcaminidae, whose destiny Greek history shows to have always been closely linked to that of international money power. During the period when the national currency of Sparta maintained its integrity, it might be safe to say that the Spartan, insofar as it is possible for true freedom to exist, was a free man, and certainly more free than those classes of the semi-mass production lines of other Greek city-states, whose monetary systems were almost all, whether fiduciary and of state issue or not, at the mercy of the bankers, and therefore the manipulators of the value of bullion and slaves, wherever it was they maintained their center, generally assumed to be Babylonia and its outposts, Lydia, Naucratus in the Nile Delta, Phoenicia, Athens, Cyzicus, and Colchis. A monetary system, simple, inviting neither peddlers of luxury, panderers, or pornographers to make mockery of the lives of the people, issued and regulated by a benevolent state, and undoubtedly with its units paid into circulation with care and attention to the result on the national well-being and strength, bred a sturdy, independent, racially pure people completely contemptuous of the gold madness raging elsewhere. They were an example by which other great peoples came to profit, and outstandingly the Romans. They lived with a feeling of great superiority to the Athenians, who, while having a plentiful currency, except during the periods of exhaustion of the Laurian silver mines, were exposed to all the evils of control over their political life by alien money power through the trapezite, the market bankers. History gives much information about the means whereby money was collected and raised and spent, but often very little about those shadowy figures who institute its units in the first place, and as in the case of the bankers' democracies, inject them into the circulation. As to when international money power re-entered Sparta, there is little enough evidence. But the outlook of King Archidamus suggested it had made quite some progress by the date of the commencement of the Peloponnesian War, and it may be safely said that to win that war, out of which could come nothing but gain to the international money power, Sparta had to make some great concessions.
The final victory over Athens and her empire, which ended the war, achieved the purpose of the international bullion and slave traders as surely as final defeat would have done. As it will be remembered, the relaxation and luxury that inundated Rome after the Second Punic War, as a result of the concessions that had been made to international bullion and slave traders in order to be able to rearm, after Cannae, within twenty-five years dragged the Romans down, to a debauched money-mad mob, though still mighty through the employment at arms of defeated peoples. Similarly, after the Peloponnesian War, like causes had done the same for Sparta, and it was only 25 years later in 371 BC that the Spartan phalanx, softened to the core, crumbled into bloody ruin at the Battle of Leuctra to a Pamenondes of Thebes, and never again recovered the Elan that had made it the victor of a hundred battles. For the Spartans now were consumed by the corrupting diseases of money madness and its attendant liberalism. By then, the ancient money system that had been the factor behind the morale of the Spartans at Thermopylae was little more than a memory, and the crime of Gallippus in 360 BC and the decree offered upon its exposure that no coin of gold or silver be admitted into Sparta, but that they should use the money that had formerly obtained, shows that as this decay of the state and weakening of credit went on in gold or silver coins, at or near their bullion value, gradually crept into circulation as money. The failure of this decree to pass legislation is conclusive that the iron numerical system was no longer practicable. In other words, the damage to that which had been Sparta and its people done by the ruler who first of all turned a blind eye to dealings in the precious metals, the regrowth of international trade, and no doubt the holding of deposits in Athenian banks, and who failed to deal with ferocity with those who interfered with the Pelinors either by counterfeiting or speculation, was irreparable. It seemed this time the clock could not be turned back. Having reviewed the fall of Sparta to international banking interests, we can better understand the past two centuries of European history, and more ably recognize the architects of our common demise.